So what we're going to explore, we're going to explore plot, characters, context, themes and how to respond. But first of all, I've given you 10 keywords that you can use in your response. But I want you to do this task on your own if you want to by defining the words that I've given you and seeing how you can use them in your response, but it's optional. So we're gonna start off with plot very, very quickly. So first of all, Macbeth meets the witches. This is in act one. And Lady Macbeth encourages Macbeth to actually kill the king after meeting the witches and receiving the prophecies that he will be king. In Act 2, Macbeth kills Duncan and becomes king. In Act 3, Banquo has Ban sorry, Macbeth has Banquo killed. In Act 4, um, he receives more predictions from the witches and Macduff swears revenge and that's because Macbeth actually has his wife and kids killed. And in Act 5, Lady Macbeth suffers guilt and she ends up killing herself. And Macduff defeats Macbeth by beheading him after a big battle. So that is more or less everything that happens. Feel free to pause the video and write these um, key events down. And make sure that you know the what act these events actually take place in. So it would be good for you to have that down for revision. So now we're going to go through characters. I've given you the key characters. We're going to start off with Macbeth. So, a captain in Duncan's army, later the Thane of Glamis and Cawdor. When three witches predict that he will one day be king of Scotland, he takes his fate into his own hands, allowing his ambition and that of his wife to overcome his better judgment. His bloody reign culminates in a battle against Malcolm and the English forces. Lady Macbeth, the devilish wife of Macbeth, whose ambition helps to drive her husband toward the desperate act of murder. Subsequently, her husband's cruelty and her own guilt recoil on her, sending her into a madness from which she never recovers. Duncan, King of Scotland. His victories against rebellious kinsmen and the Norwegians have made him a popular and honoured king. His decision to pass the kingdom to his son Malcolm provokes his untimely death at the hands of Macbeth. Donalbane and Malcolm, Duncan's two sons, fearful of implication in their father's murder, they flee Scotland, Donalbane to Ireland and Malcolm to England, where he raises a large army with the intention of toppling the tyrant Macbeth. Banquo, a fellow captain and companion of Macbeth, who also receives a prophecy from the witches that his children will one day succeed to the throne of Scotland. This information is sufficient to spell his death at the hands of resentful Macbeth, who is later haunted by Banquo's ghost. Macduff, a thane or nobleman of Scotland, who discovers the murdered King Duncan, suspecting Macbeth and eventually turning against him. Macduff later flees to England to join Malcolm. When Macbeth arranges the murder of his wife and children, Macduff swears personal revenge. Just a few more characters. We've got Lennox, Ross, Menteith, Angus and Caithness, Thanes of Scotland all of whom eventually turn against the tyrannical Macbeth. Then we've got the porter, the old man, the doctors, three commentators on events, all of whom have a certain degree of wisdom and foresight. The porter hints at the hell-like nature of Macbeth's castle. The old man associates the murder of King Duncan with the instability of the natural world. The doctors recognise disease and, and disorder even though they cannot cure it. The witches, three agents of fate who reveal the truth, or part of it, to Macbeth and Banquo, and who later appear to confirm the downfall and tragic destiny of the tyrannical Macbeth. Macbeth is known to be a fierce, brave Scottish soldier. He is portrayed to be a ruthless warrior, slaughtering anyone in order to serve and be loyal to his country. 
He is also said to be dedicated and loyal to his wife, Lady Macbeth. Macbeth proves to be a man who is greatly influenced by his per- by his wife's ideas and ambition at the start of the play. When Lady Macbeth is introduced, she immediately starts plotting Duncan's murder. She is much stronger, more ruthless and more ambitious than Macbeth. She is the complete opposite as to how women were viewed at the time Shakespeare wrote the play. Being a soldier, Macbeth has experienced and being surrounded by horror and death. He had killed many in his lifetime and did not think think twice about it. However, he found it extremely emotionally draining contemplating whether or not to kill the king. He was slowly going insane from guilt before any crime had been committed. The Macbeth scene at the start of the play compared to the Macbeth scene at the end of the play are complete opposites. The need for power drives Macbeth until he goes against everything he is known for. He becomes power hungry, greedy, ambitious. It seems as though he becomes insane mainly because he is feeling both ambition and guilt at the same time. Historical context. Macbeth is a play written around 1606 by William Shakespeare. Shakespeare was writing for the theatre during the reigns of Queen Elizabeth I and King James I. The plays he wrote around the time Queen Elizabeth was in control, such as Midsummer Night's Dreams, contains themes of confidence, happiness and love. However, the plays he wrote during the reign of King James, such as Macbeth, were more cynical and dark, reflecting the insecurities of King James. Macbeth is known as one of Shakespeare's most strong and forceful plays, The play was written in 1606, a time in history that was called the Elizabethan era. The Elizabethan age was an age of discovery and of expansion. Shakespeare's plays were written for the average man or women in the street. The concerns of the time were reflected in Shakespeare's plays, many of which feature kings and queens struggling to hold on to their power or having it taken from them by someone considered considered evil. The question whether one person's ambition should or could be important than the common good is clearly evident in Shakespeare's play Macbeth. In Act 2, Scene 1, Macbeth's ambitious thoughts are slowly forcing him to commit the crime. Shakespeare in era, witches were associated with the dark and death. They were said by many Christian countries to be agents of Satan and performing evil acts at night. When Shakespeare wrote Macbeth, witchcraft and supernatural happenings were of high interest. King James I was highly engaged with the idea of witchcraft and even wrote a book about the topic. He used them for his play and many of his audience would have believed in them as evil servants, trapping the power of men and women. In Act 2, Scene 2, Shakespeare mentions witchcraft through the soliloquy, nature seems dead and wicked, wicked dreams abused. The curtains sleep, witchcraft celebrates pale Hecate's offerings and withered murder. Here Macbeth is using a direct link to Hecate, who is the goddess of witches for the ancient Greeks. Philosophical context. Religious thinkers in the Middle Ages had come up with the idea of the great chain of being. This was a belief held by many that God had designed an orderly system for both nature and humankind. Everything had its place in the great chain of being. It was considered a sin against God for anybody to try and alter their station in the chain. The divine rights throughout Shakespeare's time and beyond monarchs were seen as being God's deputies on earth, having a divine right to rule. The monarch had absolute power and an attack on him or her, even a verbal one, was considered to be a treason. In Macbeth it was a shock to the audience when Macbeth had planned to kill the King of Scotland. This meant at that time it would have been an incredibly dangerous crime to commit as it was going against all beliefs. In Act 2, Scene 1, Macbeth was feeling guilty even before he had committed the crime because he knew that it was against God. In that time, it would have been one of the biggest scandals ever committed in history. He was disturbing the great chain of being, altering the complete nature of mankind. Therefore, Shakespeare wrote this scene to show how the craving for power led him to do something never ever heard of. 
This is another reason as to why Macbeth began to see hallucinations and vision of the mind, mainly from absolute fear for all he is going against. So I've got a little context quiz I'd like you to attempt just to see if um, see what you can remember, to be honest with you. So if you can pause the video now and have a go at filling in the blanks, I've given you the words on the right hand side um, and we'll look at the answers in a second. Okay, so here is the order of the answers. Witchcraft, King James, witches, written, killed, guilt, fear, influence, ambitious, scandals, belief, sin, and hecate. So um, see what you've got correct and anything that you've got wrong, please just correct that. Okay, so now we're going to go on to themes. Here are the main themes that I wanted to introduce you to. Ambition, betrayal and revenge, the supernatural, fate and free will, appearance and reality, guilt and madness. So I'm going to go through this in detail, so you might want to make notes on this. So when we talk about ambition, it means a strong desire to do or achieve something. How does Shakespeare present Macbeth's ambition? When King Duncan names Malcolm as his successor, Macbeth sees Malcolm as an obstacle in his path. Macbeth admits that ambition is his only reason for killing Duncan. Macbeth's ambition is more powerful than his conscience. His ambition is not satisfied once he is king as he wants to make sure that his position is secure. He tries to, su he tries to destroy those who threaten his power. How do other characters help develop the theme? Well, Lady Macbeth is ambitious. She persuades him to kill King Duncan. After the witches tell Macbeth he will be king, Banquo asks them to speak to him and thinks carefully about their prediction that his descendants will become kings. Unlike Macbeth, Banquo is suspicious of the witches and, although he has ambitions, he does not act on them. So here are five, five key quotations for the theme of ambition. Make sure you write this out. So we've got Lady Macbeth, when it comes to Macbeth. Those be great are not without ambition, but without the illness that should attend it. So that's her talking about Macbeth and the fact that he definitely has ambition, but he doesn't have enough evil in him to actually succeed in anything that he wants to do. When uh, Macbeth talking about uh, Malcolm becoming named heir, that is a step on which I must fall down or else overleap. Macbeth considering murdering King Duncan. No spur to prick the sides of my intent, but only vaulting ambition. Macbeth feeling threatened by Banquo. To be thus is nothing, but to be safely thus. And Banquo asking the witches to predict his future. If you can look into the seeds of time and say which grain will grow and which will not, speak to me. Okay, betrayal and revenge. So betrayal means to be gravely disloyal. And revenge, the action of hurting or harming someone in return for an injury or wrong suffered at their hands. How does Shakespeare develop the theme of betrayal? Well, the first Thane of Cawdor betrays King Duncan, which foreshadows the fact that Macbeth, the second Thane of Cawdor, will betray him. When Macbeth betrays King Duncan by murdering him, he sets in motion the chain of events which together form the tragedy. Nobles like Macduff and Lennox join Malcolm, which highlights Macbeth's increasing isolation. Shakespeare also suggests that Macbeth, Macbeth's cruel leadership betrays Scotland because the country then weeps and bleeds. How does Shakespeare develop the theme of revenge? Banquo's ghost haunts Macbeth, which is a form of revenge. When Fleance escapes from the murders, Shakespeare leaves us wondering if he will return to avenge his father's death or take the throne. Malcolm attacks Macbeth's castle and claims the throne in the belief that his revenge will heal the wounded Scotland. Macduff avenges his family's murders by killing, King, by killing Macbeth, which fulfills the witch's prophecies. Five key quotes. So, King Duncan on the first Thane of Cawdor. No more 
that Thane of Cordor shall deceive our bosom interest, go pronounce his present death. Macbeth, after seeing Banquo's ghost, they say blood will have blood. Menteith on Malcolm and Macduff, revenges burn in them. Malcolm on healing Scotland, let's make us medicines of our to cure this deadly grief. And Macduff to Macbeth, if thou be slain, and with no stroke of mine, my wife and children's ghosts will haunt me still. Appearance and reality. Appearance is the way that someone or something looks. Reality is the state of things as they actually exist, as opposed to an idealistic or notional idea of them. How does Shakespeare develop the theme? While Duncan describes Macbeth's castle as a pleasant place, the audience know it is the setting for his murder. When Macbeth and his wife pretend to welcome the king to their castle, King Duncan trusts them. The witch's riddles make Macbeth believe that he has a charmed life, but their words foreshadow his downfall and death. Malcolm pretends to be a bad leader to test Macduff, which suggests that he is a suspicious character. Burnham Wood appears to move, even though trees cannot uproot themselves, suggesting that the other predictions will also come true. What clues does Shakespeare give the audience? Shakespeare used to, uses soliloquies and asides to show the audience his character's true thoughts. He also allows the audience to overhear private conversations such as Macbeth and Lady Macbeth's discussion about murdering Duncan. Shakespeare uses dramatic irony. For example, when Malcolm suggests that Macbeth has done nothing to harm Macduff, but the audience knows that Macduff's family has already been killed. Macbeth is the only one that can see Banquo's ghost and the dagger, which suggests they may not be real. Five key quotes. The witch's ambiguous language, lesser than Macbeth and greater. Macbeth on disguising his true intentions. Stars hide your fires, let not light see my black and deep desires. Lady Macbeth on a deadly disguise, look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. Macbeth on deception, false face must hide what the false heart doth know. Burnham Wood starts to move. I looked toward Burnham and anon we thought the wood began to move. Guilt and madness. Guilt is the fact of having committed a, spe a specified or implied offence or crime. Madness is the state of having a serious mental illness. How does Shakespeare present Macbeth's guilt and madness? Well, Macbeth is not afraid to kill in battle, but he is distressed after killing King Duncan and claims every noise appalls me. He thinks he hears a voice saying sleep no more. This probably is his guilty conscience. His guilty conscience may also produce his visions of the dagger and Banquo's ghost. He almost reveals his guilt when he sees the ghost. Macbeth shows signs of paranoia when he sees Banquo as a threat. And in Act 5, Macbeth shows little guilt, but he is reluctant to fight Macduff because the murders of Macduff's family are on his conscience. How does Shakespeare present Lady Macbeth's guilt and madness? Initially, Lady Macbeth seems to feel no guilt about killing King Duncan and is critical when Macbeth feels distressed. In Act 5, her guilt seems, sees her sleepwalking and carrying a light because she fears the darkness. She probably commits suicide because of her troubled conscience. Five key quotes. Lady Macbeth after Duncan's murder. These deeds must not be thought after these ways so it will make us mad. Macbeth's mental disturbance. Methought I heard a voice cry. Sleep no more. Macbeth to Banquo's ghost. Thou canst not say I did it. Never shake thy gory locks at me. Lady Macbeth's agita agitation while sleepwalking. Out, damn spot, out. And Macbeth's loss of guilt. My slaughterous thoughts cannot once start me. Fate and free will. Fate is the course of someone's life or the outcome of a situation for someone or something seen as outside their control. Free will is the power of acting without the constraint or necess of necessity or fate. The ability to act at one's own discretion. How far does Macbeth determine his own fate? Well, Macbeth could have waited to see if he became king without taking any action. 
Macbeth has plenty of reasons not to kill King Duncan, but he goes ahead with the murder because of his ambition. Banquo is Macbeth's friend, but Macbeth decides to kill him and flounce to secure the, fr- the throne. An apparition tells Macbeth be wary of Macduff, but it does not tell him to murder Macduff's wife and children. Macbeth fears he is destined to die when Macduff finally confronts him, but he chooses to fight rather than surrender. How far do other characters influence Macbeth's decisions? Well, the witch's suggestion that Macbeth will become king sows the seeds for murder. Lady Macbeth encourages Macbeth to kill Duncan and takes control of the arrangements for murder. Lady Macbeth persuades Macbeth to change his mind after he decides not to kill Duncan. And the witch's promise for Macbanquo and their warning about Macduff prompts Macbeth to plan more murders. Five key quotes. The supernatural soliciting cannot be ill, cannot be good. So that's Macbeth after he's made then of Cawdor. Macbeth on the predictions. If chance will have me king, why chance may crown me. Macbeth on choosing not to kill King Duncan. We will proceed no further in this business. Macbeth plotting murder. Fleance, his son, whose absence is no less material to me than his father's, must embrace the fate of that dark hour. Macbeth vowing to fight on. Though Burnham would be come to Dunsinane, and though opposed being of no woman born, yet I will try the last. The Supernatural. Some force beyond scientific understanding or the laws of nature. How is the supernatural presented? The supernatural is important throughout Macbeth as it was in Jacobean society and is especially prevalent through the witches and Lady Macbeth. Shakespeare first presents supernatural through the witches chant, fair is foul and foul is fair. The fact they talk in rhyme makes them seem strange and links to the theme of supernatural. A Jacobean audience would fear this supernatural behaviour, putting them on edge from the start of the play. The witch's omniscience is mysterious and links to the supernatural. This ability to predict future events would certainly lead audiences to believe the witches were speaking to the supernatural. Therefore, the theme of supernatural is presented through the witch's tone and omniscience. Where else in the play is the supernatural explored? The supernatural is also presented through Lady Macbeth talking to the evil spirits. The writer later presents supernatural through Macbeth's visions. And Shakespeare finally presents the supernatural through Lady Macbeth's madness. So I'm going to show you some quotes. Fair is foul, foul is fair. When the witches open the play, the witches predict Macbeth's success. All hail Macbeth that shall be king hereafter. Lady Macbeth calls on the spirits, take my milk for gore. Lady Macbeth hallucinates, is this a dagger which I see before me? And Lady Macbeth goes mad, out damn spot, out I say. So the final thing is I'm going to introduce you to some tips on writing a developed response. Now this is not necessarily a structure for you, it's just something that you want to consider and include in your response if you struggle with developing your response. So number one, try to reword the question so that you are always referring back to it. Um, Number two, use evidence to answer the question. Number three, explain the meaning of the quote. Number four, select keywords from the quote to develop. And number five, evaluate Shakespeare's intentions slash contextual relevance, if relevant. So pause the video and get these down. So I've got some example responses. I've got four for you. So I'm just looking at four um, themes and you can see I've colour coded exactly where I've actually um reworded the question, used evidence, explained the meaning, selected key words and um, looked at his intentions and linked to context if relevant. So the question, an example question is how does Shakespeare present ambition? Shakespeare presents ambition by that is a step on which I must fall down or else I'll believe. This suggests that Macbeth believes Malcolm is in his way as if he is an obstacle in his path. Macbeth's ambition is presented in the words step and overleaf. These words imply that he wants to climb ahead of Malcolm in order to be successful and become king. 
Macbeth's ambition is further emphasised through the use of the strong verb must, which suggests that his ambition is more powerful than his conscience. Shakespeare is using Macbeth as a vehicle to highlight him as a classical protagonist that has fatal flaws which will lead to nothing but death and suffering. I'll show you another example here. How does Shakespeare present revenge? Shakespeare prevents, prevents, presents revenge by revenge is burned in them. This suggests that Malcolm and Macduff have rage inside them and are full of revenge. The word burn could suggest that their desire for revenge may be fueled by their anger at the crimes committed against them. In Shakespeare's time, fire was associated with purification, so this image could also imply that their revenge might rid Scotland of Macbeth's evil. So as you can see, I haven't necessarily included um, my context at the end of weaved into what I was saying. How does Shakespeare present appearance and reality? Shakespeare presents appearance and reality by look like the innocent flower, but be the serpent under it. This suggests Lady Macbeth is telling Macbeth to have the appearance of an innocent flower, but be ready to strike like a snake at any moment. The word serpent has connotations of evil and foreshadows the evil that Macbeth will consume later on in the play. The audience at this time would be shocked at the appearance of Lady Macbeth as she holds the control and is giving orders. This would shock the audience as Lady Macbeth is a woman and therefore should obey her husband. And finally, does how does Shakespeare portray the theme of fate and free will. Shakespeare presents fate and free will by if by chance will have me king why chance may, may crown me. This shows Macbeth's weak defence against his imagination in the hope that if destiny chance will get, have him to be king then destiny will do the dirty work and he won't have to lift a finger. Therefore chance may crown him without his stirring in his own service. In particular the subjunctive mood of may suggests that Macbeth may still have to do it himself. The repetition of the word chance could further highlight Macbeth's feeling towards the prediction and could highlight that he will not be, he not, will not be leaving it to fate and will make the prediction come true. So that's all I've got for you guys. I hope that this has helped you in some way and I'll see you soon. Bye.